Now, on the UC2, we consider more religious beliefs and practices. What is a person? It's one of today's questions. Guess what Timmy's been up to? He thinks he's found the perfect scheme to do less work in life. It's a great idea, Anjou. I've developed these clones. Do you know what a clone is? Mm -hmm. It's a bit like a clot, but it's not. It's a clone. And basically, I've got these four people who look exactly like me, and they'll do all my work, and I won't have to do anything at all. Brilliant! Does it work? Of course it does. Come on, in you come. <laughs> Blah. Blah. Timmy, I forgot to mention it. The postman was here earlier with this cake. It's got Ooh. your name on it. I think it's from a grateful viewer. Look, it's not wow. beautiful. Look at that. That's fantastic. fantastic. And it's all for me. Unfortunately, it's already been cut. One for you. One for you. One for you. And one for you. Great. Just a minute. Where's my bit? Oh. Well, just think of it. You'll be able to enjoy it four times as much. Just a minute. That's not... What a honey man. It's all... all... Bleah. If you could be someone else, who would you rather be? I'd like to be Steve Cram because he's a fast runner and he has a lot of experience of running. And I like running. If I could be someone else, I'd like to be Maddie Hayes out of Moonlighting because she's very pretty and has lovely hair. If I could be someone else, I'd like to be Eddie Murphy because he's funny and does funny jokes. If I could be someone else, I'd like to be President of the United States because I'd like to cut down on the crime and the robberies and it would be something for me to set out to do. If I could be someone else, I'd like to be Phil Cool because his impressions are just like the man he's taking off. Whoever you might like to be, the fact is, like it or not, you are you. But the question is, what are you? OK, so you're a human being. But have you ever wondered what a human being is? It's not a very easy question to answer. And so today we're going to try and answer that question by creating one real human being, Timmy, by putting in all the bits we've got here. And maybe if we use all those things that it makes to make up a human being, we might have a real Timmy mallet. So what do we need? We need some fat. Can I have some fat, please? Enough fat for seven bars of soap. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, all it goes in there. Wonderful. Thank you. What else? Sugar. Can I have some sugar, please? Enough sugar for seven cups of tea. Wow, that's a lot of sugar. Right, thank you. Now, some iron. Thank you. Enough iron to make up a nail. This massive big nail. And it goes. Now, the next thing Lime. Can I have some lime? Right. That's a lot of lime there. Enough lime to wash out one chicken coop. Right. In it goes. Four. Right. Thank you. Now, some phosphorus, please. Enough phosphorus to put tips on 2,000 matches. Thank you. That's a lot of matches. I've never seen as many. Next, some magnesium. Enough for... One dose of salts. Enough potash to explode a toy crane like this one. And we also need enough sulfur to get rid of the fleas from one dog. Thanks, Haley. Thank you. Now, last item. It's complete. Oh, doesn't quite look like Timmy Mallet, does it? There's something missing. I'm sure I've forgotten something. Oh, yes, water. Lots and lots of water. Thank you. Oh, 
the specks have fallen off. Never mind. Nearly three quarters of what I'm building up is made up of water. I get. Doesn't quite look like to me yet, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so the EQDA on you is what's the extra thing that actually makes a person live? And that's a really big EQDA, isn't it? Yeah. When you think about it, a human body can't possibly move as fast as a racing car. So when it comes to moving, it's comparatively useless. Yeah, and it can't do sums like a computer can, so thinking-wise, it's comparatively hopeless. And since a human can't fly like an aeroplane, in one sense you might say that life is just plain dull. But something makes life more special than speed, more valuable than movement, more precious than machines. So what is it? Here's the question. How can beautiful music come from a filthy old violin? And why does an old man see it as something special? They're just some of the questions looked at in Fiddle at the Fair. There was only one thing at the school fair that looked as if it would be left over. An old violin on the bric-a-brac stall. Well, its strings are broken, it was dirty and scratched, and it hadn't been played for years. This is a very old violin. I'm sure that you would like to buy it. No, I'd rather buy this, please. Nobody wanted an unstrung violin, and it sat with all the junk. The noise of all this buying and selling woke up an old man who'd been having a kip amongst all the rubbish by the dustbins. When he heard somebody talking about an old violin, for some reason, he seemed very interested. Really old violin, but I'm positive you would like to buy it. No, thank you. I'd rather buy this. So the violin was unsold. The old man searched all over, looked at everything. But when he saw that filthy, broken violin, his face seemed to go all sort of happy in the way it looked. How much is this? I'll give it to you free. I know it's a bit old, but really nobody wants to buy it, so I'll rather give it to you free. Yeah. Oh. Well, he seemed pleased as punch he could have the instrument no one else wanted. He took it all, got out his way, and gave the dull old bodywork a good polish. It was funny, but as he polished it, he seemed to be caring for it in a very special way. It was almost as if he was breathing a sort of new life into it. And then something quite amazing. That old man started to play that violin, and suddenly everyone started to dance. At the end of the dance, everyone was so happy, they had some questions to ask. Here, yeah, how come you can play such good music? And why does that violin mean so much to you? This violin is special to me because a long time ago, I made it. Just as the violin was brought into a sort of new life when the old man got hold of it, some people believe that through their religious beliefs, they can see something different about their own life. For Christians, the ceremony of baptism talks about life being much more than just what we live in our earthly bodies. Find out what happened when Louisa went along to a local church to see a baptism. My name is Louisa. My family and I are Christians. My sister Rebecca and I come to St. John's Church every Sunday. I sing in the choir with lots of my friends. Today is a special service because Matthew is being baptised and we can watch. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? 
I believe and trust in him. And so God gives us the way to a second birth, a new creation and life in union with him. Baptism is the sign and seal of this new birth. Quite often in my church, people are baptized when they are still babies, but Matthew is nine, and that is not unusual. Matthew, Frank, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the service, Father Peter signs sign Matthew you with the sign of the cross the sign and of gives the cross. him a special candle to show he has this is passed to show from darkness that you to have light. Passed from darkness All of us welcome light. him as a member of God's family. He will come back here on Sunday when the church will be full of people to welcome him. We believe that everyone is a very special person to God. We are inheritors together of the kingdom of God. We welcome you. Here's a story which is based on a Christian parable which talks about the question, what do you do with things that you're given? I've got some rather special varieties of seed here and I'm trusting you to take good care of them whilst I'm away, said the chief gardener. He handed out the little paper packets with brightly coloured pictures to the three gardeners, Flowerpot, Grow Bag and Green Fingers. Once he'd left, Flowerpot made straight for the shed where there was a wooden box on the top shelf. He thought, well, I don't want these getting damaged or stolen, so I'll keep them under lock and key and bolt the potting shed door. Growbag figured out, if I get these into the ground quickly, I can leg it over to the swings and slide and have a bit of fun before the park closes. By then, Greenfingers was on his way back from the library with a book on how to look after delicate plants. It explained how important it is to be patient and gentle with young seedlings. It said that plants are like people because they both need tender, loving care, and that a good gardener believes deep down that something really wonderful can begin with a tiny speck. The garden began to look beautiful. Several shoots began to turn into flowers where Growback had planted seeds and green fingers had tended and watered the flower bed into a beautiful display, whilst flower pots stood guard outside the shed to keep off vandals. The three gardeners had almost forgotten about Super Park, the chief gardener until the day he came back. I've still got your seeds, exclaimed Flowerpot. Nothing's happened to them since he gave them to me. Super Park didn't need to be shown what Growbag and Greenfingers had done. You've got a few nice things going there, Growbag, and I'd like to put you in charge of our allotment project. Greenfingers, yours are too beautiful for words. Would you take on responsibility for new developments? Flowerpot stood waiting too choked to speak, with a sad but hopeful expression. Don't worry, Flowerpot, you can still keep your job here. And I know what you're thinking, said Super Park. You've kept the seeds safe and dry, but I asked you to take care of them. Seeds aren't meant to stay seeds. They're supposed to fill the world with flowers and fruit, with beautiful colours and delicious scents. All you've done is stop them growing. Now here's someone who can look at a few questions about how we fit in with nature. David Bellamy. Let's find him down in the middle of the forest. The whole of my forest is a patchwork of baby trees and growing trees and adult trees and mature trees and even some fantastic old grandfather trees. And it's a beautiful, wonderful place, even on a rainy day like this. Because remember, without the rain, part of the cycle of life going on all the time, there wouldn't be any trees anyway. Well, underneath the canopy of the tree, I don't need the umbrella, and nor do the wood ants, and that's why they built their giant nest here. You see, the tree's finished with all these needle leaves, and then the ants have foraged out through the forest and collected the leaves and built them this wonderful waterproof nest. And inside there are millions and millions of ants hiding out of the way of the rain. Now, as they forage their way out through the forest, they come across all sorts of dead things, and they use those up um, as food. And see, we've got a pretty unusual visitor there. I don't know what made the poor little blue tit die, but there it's fallen down here on the forest floor, and soon it will disappear. 
I'm off to ask, where did dead birds go? Well, they go into these cycles of life, and slowly but surely that, yes, even the feathers will disappear thanks to the ants and the insects and the fungi and the bacteria to become part of the forest floor. And then, of course, the nutrients from that bird, they go up and help the tree to grow just a little bit taller, and perhaps its parents will build its nest up there one day in the future. All part of these cycles of life, you know, and perhaps it's because I can come out to a marvellous place like this every day that I have no true fear of being dead. Oh yes, I'm a coward, I rather wonder, well, how and when I might die, but actually being dead, you know, fills me with quite a lot of wonder, because what will I become? Say, you know, say after I've died, I had my ashes brought out here and sprinkled in the forest, then part of David Bellamy may one day be part of a tree. And then the ants may collect part of David Bellamy and build it into their nest. And then perhaps I'll be eaten by another insect, and then that insect by a bat. And we put many, many bat boxes up in the forest here so there are houses with the bats, and I will be able to fly. You see, so the cycles of life and death, you and I are part of those. And if only we care enough, we can create heavens like this right on Earth, a heaven where animals and plants and people and trees can enjoy themselves in those cycles of life. And if the heaven we all go to when we die is as perfect as the one we could create here on Earth, then I don't mind being dead, and I wouldn't really mind being an ant either. How would you begin to show that we're all special and that we're all part of this fantastic, beautiful world with trees, flowers and animals? One way could be with poetry, music and dance. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts its leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts its leafy arms to pray. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. But poems are made by fools like me, and only God can make a tree. But poems are made by fools like me, and only God can make a tree. I like that. Good Indian dance, wasn't it? Mm. Okay, some of the questions which came up in questions today include what goes into a human body. And what makes a human being so special? Okay, how do you get music from an old violin that nobody wants? Oh yeah, and what happens at a Christian baptism, do you know? And uh, what's the best thing to do with seeds? How different are we all? Who would you rather be? And how do you keep dry when you're presenting a TV show? Stay, Stay well, well away, away from, from you! you. <laughs>